This offseason for the Baltimore Ravens has literally been non-stop. Uh, we're already in the month of June. We're two months away from preseason, three months away from the regular season. So we're getting right there, and it feels like stuff is maybe starting to slow down. But at the same time, who knows? It could just be picking up. But as of right now, where the Ravens stand... They still have a couple of questions uh, that surround this team. And to help us answer some of those questions and to talk about some of those topics, we brought on a very, very, very special guest. Yeah, this feels like a dream. And you know just what I mean. You see my boy, he like got to made it, how to made it. Boy, he's a fan and he like the Ravens, like the Ravens. And you know just what I mean. Team Keep It Clean, very, very special guest in the building, Bobby Trossett, Bobby Baltimore. Welcome to the channel. Uh, before we dive into things, I want Team Keep It Clean to get to know you, get to know your background story, get to know who you are, why you're doing what you're doing, how you jumped into YouTube. So let's, let's hear it. Tell us about Bobby Baltimore. Absolutely. And I appreciate you having me on, man. I've been watching sure. your stuff for a long time. You know that. And uh, I know you don't, you're not this type of guy, right? But you are the blueprint on Ravens YouTube. So I appreciate you having me on first and foremost. But uh, yeah, I'm originally from upstate New York, the Albany area, came down to school in Baltimore and really never left. I did a, a, br a brief little two-year stint in D.C. But uh, when, when Keith Mills' job opened up, and, and he is uh, the longtime sportscaster in Baltimore, when his job opened up at, at the, the flagship station of the Ravens at WBAL, I jumped at the opportunity. I was I, I earned the opportunity. I was given the opportunity. And so uh, we're really just a, a couple months removed after a, a, almost three years with the team working the, the Ravens post game and pregame shows and, mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff alike in, in Baltimore sports. Uh, we're just a few months removed from me taking that that next step in my career to, to plunge headfirst into YouTube, and and I'll be launching a podcast later on this summer. And so, I'm really excited. You know, we were talking about it before we came on. It, mm -hmm. There's a certain freedom and uh, flexibility, and and even an innovation that comes with this this space. And I know you've mm -hmm. enjoyed that throughout your time as well. And so, right. it, it's been a Wow, I don't even know. It's it's been invigorating, you know, reinvigorating, and so pretty fired up about it. And I'm fired up to talk about you know OTAs and everything that's coming up right now and and all things Ravens with you. Oh yeah, for sure, man. And appreciate you coming on. Now you did mention uh, you're gonna be starting a podcast. Now is that podcast gonna be uh, based around like Baltimore sports, or is it gonna be more personal? Or what what's the podcast gonna be about? Yeah, it's going to be all things Ravens. Uh, I am sort of strong to uh, keeping it hush hush for right now, just based oh, okay. on uh, the terms and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I am I am comfortable enough to say that it will be coming at some point, the launch at some point this summer. So uh, I'll definitely have more on that soon. All right, cool. So we'll look out for it. And before we get into things, where can everybody find you at as far as Twitter, YouTube, even though everything's going to be down below in the description, where can everybody find you? Yeah, wherever, man. You just you mentioned it. You know, I'm I'm pretty active on on the big four, right? YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, I still, uh, I'm, my millennial self should be more in TikTok, but uh, right now I, I just I'm so focused on building the channel that I'll get into TikTok in a little bit. But you can find me on all those things just at Bobby Trossett. That's B O B B Y T R O S S E T. So. Yeah, that's true. And, and yeah, you're definitely really big on Facebook. Every Ravens group that I see, your, your name's always popping up in there, man. So let's get into it. Um, you, the other day, well, actually a couple of days ago, two different days, you went a little viral in, uh, in the Ravens community. Uh, more recently, you got Lamar going back and forth with Chris Sims. Um, and tell us how you felt about that, about Chris Sims' uh, comments about Lamar Jackson and OTAs, and just really this whole thing with Lamar Jackson and OTAs. How you feel about that? Yeah. Wow. What a day yeah. that was leading into the <laughs> holiday weekend, right? I mean, you kind of just look, I, I've gotten to know Lamar a little bit just based mm. on my role the last few years and the proximity that the role had me to the team. Mm. But to say that, you know, we're buddy buddy would be a stretch. And we he doesn't follow me online. I think he just 
it obviously started taking out, taking on some some steam, mm-hmm. and he had an opinion about it because let's face it, everybody's had an opinion recently about him right. and, and his mm-hmm. decision to skip. Yes, voluntary OTAs. So. I just thought that it was a, a compelling take. That's all. I thought it was a compelling take from Chris, mm-hmm. and I thought it was a more than fair response on Lamar. And of course, of course, those you know your viewers out there that aren't familiar, I'm sure they are at this point. But Lamar essentially clapped back at mm-hmm. Chris for criticizing him about skipping OTAs, at least the first session of OTAs. <laughs> we'll see what the, the the rest of the way looks like. But you know, yeah. Ing, I, I thought that Chris essentially alluding to comments made by Lamar earlier mm-hmm. in his career right. that he wants to be the Tom Brady of his era, put him up for the left it open for criticism. I would say, I don't I think see. it's a big deal. I do not think it's a big deal in the short term mm-hmm. that Lamar is skipping OTAs in the long term. However, I do. And I do think it sets a precedent that this disconnect this perceived disconnect between Lamar and the front office. Mm. There's multiple layers to it. And this is another layer. Mm. And so while I don't think it's a huge deal in what the 2022 season will bring for Lamar himself and this offense, I do think that in the long term, as their franchise guy, it leaves more questions than answers. Oh, yeah. There are definitely a lot of questions uh, surrounding Lamar Jackson right now. Um, now, as far as this Ravens offense this year, what what are your expectations for them based off of right here, right now, um, with the way that they've drafted, with the way that they've uh, signed uh, some different free agents and also brought some guys back to um, both recent guys like a Pat Ricard and then both some throwback guys like a Brent or well, that's not offense, but Brent Urban. But how do you feel like uh, this this Ravens offense is constructed uh, for 2022? Boy, you're getting waves of uh, 2019 in, right? I mean, they're bringing in tight ends like they're not playing, right? They they want to get back to what they were doing with those multiple tight end sets in 2019 with that high-powered historic offense. I'm not saying that they're going to sniff that. No other offense in the history of football may sniff that again in a single season. I mean, they broke all kinds of records, as you know. Mm -hmm. But can they get back to a certain percentage of that? Can they get back to consistently protecting the quarterback? And I think when when you look at the offseason that was for the front office led by EDC, there's a lot of boxes that have been checked. Right. Have there been any big splashes? I think Marcus Williams on the defensive side of things can yeah. be coined as a splash. I would call mm-hmm. him a splash. Yeah, that's one. Um, but, but there hasn't been anything crazy. And I think that's okay because if they get half of the guys back that they, in, in some form, of what they once were that were injured throughout the, you know, the contingent of players, the, the plethora of players that were down last year. If some of those guys come back, that's already having success in free agency, even though they've been under contract. Mm-hmm. So they've shored up the offensive line. They have bolstered the running back room and brought in much needed depth that they did not have last year after their main guys went down. We saw that. Mm-hmm. That's no disrespect to Latavius and Devante. Right, right. I think I think we could all probably agree on that. There was a significant mm-hmm. drop off. I really like what they've done this offseason. But to get back to your question about the offense, is there a number one receiver on this team right now? That remains to be seen. Can Rashad be that guy? I think so. Will it be this season? I don't know. I think yeah. that there's a, a a long story short. They went out and addressed significant needs that this mm-hmm. fan base was crying for and they should have been crying for it. and yeah. they went and, and handled that this offseason what do you think oh yeah for sure because uh the biggest thing to me uh was offensive line uh all, because offensive line last year was rough offensive line the past couple of years has been rough but also the offensive line last year has taken a big blow with losing ronnie stanley uh multiple times um and for them I, I think one of the biggest things for them was just to make sure to stay ready so they didn't have to get ready and with ronnie stanley you don't want to expect him to go out but you have to prepare better uh if he does go out uh and now i think they did that this off season with just being prepared just in case he's not ready now we all expect and hope him to be ready 
But just in case he's not, it, it seems like the Ravens are prepared for that. And also uh, at the center position, um, with them drafting Tyler Lindenbaum, they've had a lot of flip-flopping at the center position uh, over the past couple of years. They've had uh, Matt Scurro, they've had Patrick McCary, they've had Tristan Colon Castillo, um, and then, of course, Bradley Bozeman. Um, and with a lot of those, like with Patrick McCary, he didn't consistently play center. Uh, with uh, Bradley Bozeman, he just played center for the first time um, in his NFL career uh, last year. But now they're giving Lamar Jackson in his offensive line somebody who's played center throughout his collegiate career, and then he'll continue to do that in his NFL career. So he'll have that consistency. Um, so I, I really like what they've done uh, with the offensive line. Then, of course, drafting Daniel Falele, who is just – a monster among men. I, I want to see him lined up next to Ben Cleveland just to see the, the, the size comparison yeah. with those yeah. two. Oh, yeah. I worried about in practice him going up against, uh, you know, Calais or if Derek Ooh. Wolf is out there, or whoever it might be, right? I mean, mm. to your point, though, going up and down the offensive line, it it seems like it's it's been significantly shored up, right? Mm -hmm. You have a trusty, reliable vet in Morgan Moses who you expect to be the fill-in shoe in starting right tackle come September. Mm -hmm. You got the guy who was the unsung hero last year among a group that was heavily criticized in Kevin Zeitler. Just a, a brick wall, very consistent. Tyler Linderbaum is expected to be that guy, that generational type of talent, mm -hmm. and a shoe in starter at center. Mm -hmm. At left guard, I think that's probably the most uh, compelling part here, right? Is it going to be Ben Cleveland? I think the fan base probably wants it to be Ben Cleveland. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't go and pay this offseason McCary six mil a year if you're not going to use him. Perhaps he wins that job. Ben Power mm -hmm. should be in the mix as well. And and then obviously that leaves Ronnie Stanley with the, the hope that he's ready to go. And, and finally, after a two year battle with that ankle, you, you hope that he's ready to go. But I think, again, there are a lot more answers than there are questions. The opposite of what our first topic was with with this ongoing <laughs> contract dispute with Lamar in the front office. Now, back to that first topic. Um, a lot of people have said that Lamar Jackson, it seems like he has to carry this offense on his back. Um, somebody else that had to do some carrying on their back was Derek Wolf with the bear. Um, and that was another one of your, your tweets that went viral a couple days ago. And because I, I don't I don't follow Derek Wolf on Instagram, so I had no clue about it until I saw it pop up. Um, what do you feel like is gonna happen with Derek Wolf? Because there's so it's it's June 1st that we're recording this on. Um, there's been a lot of speculation amongst Ravens fans um about him possibly being a post June 1st cut. We'll see. Um what do you feel like the direction of the Ravens and Derek Wolf's relationship is headed. And have you noticed that I know you don't follow him on his as on Instagram and he's not very active on other platforms. So maybe you don't have a good feel for this, but he's been super distant, man. Like he's been very, very just at an arm's length. And I know that every NFL player leading up to mandatory minicamp and stuff like that, right? They should have that right. You know, do your own thing, because we both know as content creators, the six month grind is a grind. I mean, it's a next level grind for professional athletes when they're in, in season. So I don't want to question the way he's handled his off season or the way he's spent his free time. But I just get the sense that based on some podcasts that he went on, I know Jonas Schaefer from the Baltimore Sun hopped on. Oh, yeah. uh, the podcast snippet that essentially he was mulling retirement because of that back and hip injury that, that forced him to miss all of last year. He then clapped, speaking of clapping back, he then clapped back at Jonas, mm -hmm. even though I, I think we that. could probably, I know we were both on top of this. I think we both felt that Jonas was well in his right. He did not overstep any boundaries there. And he certainly did not, you know, jump to any conclusions. I thought Derek left himself up for that type of criticism, or at least wondering whether or not he was mulling retirement. Anyway, long story short, the whole cap casualty thing comes to mind, man. He he would free up some significant coin for them. And the way that they've bolstered this defensive line over the course of this offseason, both in free agency and in the draft, I think it's a fair question and one that I've been thinking about a lot. And you can hear it in my voice. I have I have some doubts that Derek will be back in Baltimore. Yeah, it is um 
very intriguing situation uh, because when they first signed him, yeah, that first year he did his thing, but then we just really haven't seen much of him ever since. And, and something that you did mention, yeah, when when you, I don't follow him on Instagram, but when you did post that, I did check out his Instagram and I said, okay, yeah, he's doing his thing, celebrating with his wife and his kids and stuff, which is great, which is a beautiful thing and which yes. I respect. Yes. Um, but yeah, you did mention distant because like we literally, we of course heard Calais Campbell, he came back, he talked Ravens, um, they brought Michael Pearson, Marcus Williams, and all these different guys. And we have like li literally not heard anything Nothing. From Derek Wolf, not seen him, not heard that. Oh, he's gonna be in at the facility. Nothing at all from Derek. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> now on the bear photo, though, right? To to get back to like, okay, if we are gonna see him in a few uh, weeks for mini camp, then I think we're gonna be seeing a Derek Wolf that isn't in as much pain as he was last year that required yeah. that January surgerying. Because I'm looking at his Instagram and this dude. Mm -hmm. has a 300 pound and i'm sorry for those who are, are sensitive to, to hunting out there and and some mm -hmm. obviously some folks are not uh, up for animal cruelty and not, not to say that this was animal cruelty right but it is a difficult photo to see if you don't mm -hmm. if you don't enjoy that if you have a tough time seeing it but he and it was a difficult time too to have this on the internet and because after the texas massacre so I definitely thought about that a lot before posting it. But then I did my research. It was actually bow hunting. It was not, he was not using a gun when he killed this bear. It was with bow and arrow, essentially. So I felt like it was okay to, to, to go with that, even though it's a slippery slope. Anyway, the reason why I posted it more so than anything else is because he just had surgery in January. And it was a hip surgery. Mm-hmm. And when you have a 300 pound black bear <laughs> on your back, oh man, I think that probably speaks to how your rehab's going, right? So mm -hmm. I just thought it was fair game. And so, anyway, uh, it was in Wyoming. He's a hunter, he's a blue collar guy, and I hope he had a great time out there. Yeah, it, it, it looks like he definitely had a good time picking up bears and everything like that. Um, now, to stay on the defensive line, how, how are you feeling about this defensive line? More so the pass rush. Um, because they, uh, it's expected, it's not official yet. Um, it's expected that the Ravens are going to get Justin Houston back. No, they did that, that crazy unrestricted free agent tender, which I had never heard of before this off season. Um, so he will probably be back. Uh, he of course got a Dafe away. Um, he's healthy. Um, so he, he's been at OTAs and whatnot. So that's a good thing. Um, David Ajabo, he'll be a bonus when he comes back. But how are you feeling about the pass rush uh, as far as the Ravens? Well, I think that's the big question because it has been in recent years. They've proven that they can win a ton of regular season games with a very, let's face it, lackluster pass rush. I think that's fair to say. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, they've had consistent um, pressures, right, from guys. Justin Houston comes to mind for sure. Mm -hmm. But they haven't been able to get home. And right. so – I think it's a unit that, again, to go back to the phrase of the of, of this this episode, there's probably more questions than there are answers, but they ha have gone out and addressed it. And if Adafe Owe can come back fully healthy mm -hmm. from that foot setback that he had that forced him to miss the last couple games of last season, I think we're looking at a guy who could very well be a Pro Bowl caliber guy for them. And mm -hmm. We don't know what, what David Ajabo's future is, obviously, in terms of his timetable. Right. I think the optimistic look at, at him is October. But should we look at him as a dynamic game changer type of guy come October? Now, there's going to be a learning curve, I would imagine, for a guy like that who's barely even mm -hmm. playing football for all that long, right? I mean, his, his background does not have a ton of experience playing the game of football. So I think we need mm -hmm. to have some patience with him. And we should also remember, too, that although Tyus Bowser is coming back from – his Achilles setback, he's one of your more consistent guys as well. So, uh, again, they have proven that they can win a ton of regular season games without a true X wide receiver on the offensive side of the game mm -hmm. and on the defensive side with a very lackluster pass rush. To me, those two areas have prevented them from winning consistently in postseason and, and making deep runs in the postseason. So can they make – those strides in those two areas this upcoming season, and will that will that lead to will there be a correlation there between a, a deep postseason run and, and that? 
who knows? But it just feels like those two areas come to mind as areas of concern when it comes to having mm-hmm. the the stamina and having the the consistency and the firepower to compete in, in late January. Now, how do you feel the Ravens should go about addressing that, the wide receiver position? Do you feel like they should run with the guys that they have already and the undrafted rookie free agents? Or do you think they should add somebody from the outside or trade for some? What do you think they should do there? Well, they've made it very clear how they feel about Rashad, right? Mm-hmm. When you get rid of Marquise Brown, I mean, granted, you didn't just get rid of him for nothing. Great return. Yeah. I think we can mm-hmm. all probably agree on that. And you didn't pay him, right? You didn't end up paying him. Arizona's going to have to dole out uh, the big money there. And we know the wide receiver market's next level right now. It is. Mm-hmm. By them doing that, that tells me that they feel really strongly that Rashad Bateman can be that guy. We haven't seen it yet. We've seen flashes of it. We know he's mm-hmm. silky smooth route runner. We know he's got great hands. We know his confidence is certainly oozing. There's mm-hmm. no question about that. And we know he's got great chemistry with Lamar. To me, going out to get a Julio Jones or a Will Fuller, just to, to me seems like somewhat of a Band-Aid. That seems like somewhat of a of a project like Sammy Watkins was. How do you look at the Sammy Watkins deal a year later? Was it worth it? Uh, it I feel like our expectations, they were met. Um, because with Sammy Watkins, we didn't expect him to come in here and just take over the wide receiver room. Um, I think most people expected him to miss a significant amount of games, and he did just that. Uh, when he did play, he was solid. And, and I think in the – it didn't work out as a whole, um, but he didn't. He, he met all of our expectations, especially when it came to injuries. Um, for me, like a, a Julio Jones or a Will Fuller, somebody like that, it, it would give – most of Julio Jones. Will Fuller – I mean, a, a lot of the free agents that are out there, uh, they got their injury issues. Uh, T.Y. Yeah. Hilton is another one. I, that, that's not – OBJ uh, comes to mind. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that's another one too. Uh, and even, <laughs> even before the Super Bowl injury, he – Odell Beckham has a, a history of injuries too. Yes. Um, still, he's been a good player, but he has a history of injuries. But um, I just feel like I, I don't, I don't see the Ravens going into this season, and I, I would be shocked if they did. Um, but if they went into this season with the guys, with just the guys that they have now, like a, a Bateman, a Prochet, a Duvernay, a um, Tylen Wallace, a Benjamin Victor, all the undrafted uh, rookie free agents that they signed, I would be really shocked if they did that. Um, because I just but at the same time, Eric DaCosta does seem to try to sort of be turning a page from the, the old way of Ravens do things, the way the old way of them doing things a little bit, slowly but surely, because last year he signed Sammy Watkins. I know the year before um, he and he tried to sign T.Y. Hilton last year to try to sign Juju. But those weren't like those older receivers. Um, but the year before that, he did sign Des Bryant. So that you know, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. um, and the year before that, Seth Roberts, Willie Sneed. So for sure. the most part, under Eric DaCosta, um, they've been signing younger wide receivers because again, before last season, at the beginning of uh last offseason, I think Sammy Watkins was like 27, 28. Even though me, I thought Sammy Watkins was like 30, 31 years old based off of the injury history. But when I found out he was like 27, 28, I'm like, what really? That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um yeah. so a lot of these guys feel like they're in their 30s out of yeah. imagine after what their 20s has been but yeah yeah and I, so, and I apologize we got a little thunderstorm going on right now but nah, i don't know if you fine. can hear that but uh but i think we can probably agree right that uh all those guys that we just mentioned mm-hmm. the ones that are still remaining on the market are any of them needle movers at this point in their career at what would be asked of them in baltimore i don't know I think the I would lean towards no. I think the answer is no. Um, what do you think? I think, man, needle movers. Are any one of them needle movers for for this offense? For what they're for what would be needed of them in Baltimore at this current point in the franchise? Mm. That's a good. It's question. interesting, right? <laughs> it's it's a good exercise to have. I mean. Mm. I think with Julio, I think he could come in and help. I don't think he would be asked to be this thousand yard receiver. Um, and with him, I feel like he would be on, he's not going to be like the full time, their, their number one guy, obviously. I think that still will be Rashad Bateman when that time comes. But I feel like with Julio, uh, he could give you somebody 
that can go up and get it, somebody who has that experience, somebody who will provide you quality depth because the, uh, the depth is it's lacking right now at the receiver yeah. position. Um, sure. And he's somebody that with his experience, he's literally played in every single type of game that there is. He's played in every single preseason game, every single regular season game, every type of playoff game. And of course, he's played in the Super Bowl and he's performed uh, in all of those games, too. So that experience, it could help. And not that he uh, would have to come in and be a teacher or be a mentor, but that would be another benefit of adding uh, somebody like a Julio Jones for a lot of these young guys to just help show them the ropes um, and, and help help Lamar, too. Uh, just to sort of give him that that veteran in the in the locker room in the offense in the huddle that can sort of ease Lamar as well. I feel like somebody who that was um, a couple of years back for 2019, Mark Ingram. Mark Ingram, his sure. presence was huge. It was huge, and he obviously made an impact both on and off the field. Uh, the energy that he brought. It was just crazy. And he showed that energy from jump from his first presser that he had with, with him and Earl Thomas when they had their presses together that day. The energy was there like crazy. Um, and then we saw that throughout his entirety uh, of being with the Ravens, the, the support, um, him just getting guys riled up, him talking. And he was the thing. He wasn't even a, like a big trash talker, but he was he supported his guys. He like straight up supported his guys. And I feel like the Ravens on offense right now. They're just they're missing that. Uh, who is who's gonna be that guy for them? Somebody could, of course, step up, but who is it gonna be? Yes. And I yes. feel like if somebody's gonna step up and have that voice, then I feel like it would get a lot more respect if it was somebody who had been there and done that. Um, so that's what I feel like a Julio Jones could bring. Could he move the needle? Oh, he he could push it, he could push it for sure. Now, and we know this this Ravens offense, it's not based so much around wide receivers and whatnot. We know it's like super tight end friendly and whatnot, but having a Julio Jones and I just envisioned him and I wasn't even expecting to play every single game. I feel like if we expected sure. that, that wouldn't sure. even be realistic, but having somebody like him uh, with a Rashad Bateman would approach, I feel like he could just help open stuff up for them that much more and help make Rashad Bateman and Mark Andrews and Tyler, whoever the other receivers are going to be, make their job that much easier. Um, also, while making Lamar, jo Lamar Jackson's job that much easier, too. And I think that should definitely be the goal uh, of this offseason, to try to make Lamar's job that much easier. If Julio wants to win at this point in his career and he wants to embrace the Lamar Jackson-led offense and the exciting <laughs> nature that it is playing with Lamar, right, and, and embracing, to your point, the Mark Ingram type of role, the hype man, the – tail end of your career just enjoying things and winning games and embracing the the the, the town and and the slogan the trust slogan by the way i was walking through baltimore just a couple of days ago mm -hmm. i've never i don't know why i had never seen this before but it was in fed hill and a a vehicle had their license plate trust t-r-u-z-z okay had okay. you seen that before that was news to me i'd seen it on like bios and on social media and shirts but to go to your, the length of your license plate, hey. I mean, that, that, that just speaks to, to the, yeah, exactly. And it speaks mm -hmm. to what the 2019 season was all about. But, um, but Hey, you get, I think we're on the same page here. If, if Julio at this point in his career wants to win and is open to taking a team friendly deal and because of some of the moves that they've made and will still make perhaps mm -hmm. Eric Wolf or, or whoever else, is potentially on the chopping block there, then then maybe they could make something work. And while he wouldn't be a needle mover, like you said, I think you said it, I think you said it best. He would help push it in a collective unit that would be pushing that that needle. So um we'll see. I, I would love to see. I can't wait to see how things shit. You know it's gonna be one of those random days, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna be totally the dead part of the season, right? Maybe July. You when know, nobody's guess. talking about anything. We're all on vacation, right? You're mm -hmm. trying to hang out with the family, right? You know mm -hmm. it's going to happen like that. Every time. So that's that's how they do. Every time. Because with Ravens, um, it's it's crazy how this offseason has been. It's kind of funny, too. Uh, you hear rumors, oh, Ravens are interested in a Jarvis Landry. Ravens are interested in a Melvin Gordon. Ravens are interested in a Bobby Wagner. Um, you, you heard, and, and it's been more guys, too. Uh, but... Everybody who there have been all these reports on the Ravens being interested in them, 
nothing happens. No deals. But then guys randomly just pop up. Oh, Raven signed Marcus Wade. Oh, okay. They Raven signed Morgan Mo. Oh, okay. Raven signed Brent Urban. Raven signed Mike Davis. All these guys that they signed, they just they popped out of nowhere. At least guys who weren't on the team before, because they signed Pat Ricard. And I don't think anybody was surprised about that one. But um all, all of the, the guys that they bring in that they sign, they just it just randomly pops up. So yep. For whatever the Ravens do next, uh, I'm sure it's gonna uh, Kyle Fuller. That was another one too. There you go. There so, you go. Yeah, you the know? Ravens. They. Uh... I like the way they do business. Mm -hmm. You know, I really do. I like the way they do business. Clearly, there's some agent speak going on there with some of these leaks, right? <laughs> yeah. But and we get that. It's part of the business. Uh -huh. But I think you know one thing for a topic for another day is is the fact that both sides in this Marquise Brown situation had to mm -hmm. honor. Oh, yeah. The and I know you've you've touched on this before on the channel. Both sides had to honor their commitment, and that deal does not get done on draft night, night one of the draft, without again both sides, Ravens front office and Marquise and his camp, um, you know, making sure that they hold up their ends of the bargain. And mm -hmm. I just you won't see that often, right? That that does not mm -hmm. happen th these days especially with how active Marquise is online. So anyway, I was really impressed by both sides. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And in this day and age of social media is so easy. Like, I mean, we've seen what happened with uh, Debo Samuel, even though that's gotten kind of quiet over the past like month or so. Um, but yeah, this whole Marquise, it could have it could have gotten ugly with Hollywood. It could have gotten nasty. It could have gotten just really disgusting, but it didn't. It didn't. Um, and Ravens really over these past three, four years, they have been, they've been honoring these guys' trade requests. Ravens are like, hey, if you don't want to play here, all right, cool, we'll, we'll trade you. Like yeah. with Hayden Hurst, yeah. Orlando Brown Jr., uh, and now uh, more Hollywood too. So, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's been something to see. Uh, hopefully nobody else ends up feeling that way, but you never know how stuff goes. It's business, <laughs> it's life, it is what it is. It's not a big deal. Um, so, in closing, what do you think with this Ravens team right now, whether it be offense or defense, what do you think they need to do in order for that needle to be moved? Is it something outhouse? Is it something in-house? Do you think it's a different strategy or philosophy? Or do you think it's adding a guy here or there? What do you think the Ravens need to do to really move that needle all the way and really truly be yeah. Super Bowl contenders? Yeah, I don't think it's all that complicated. You know, I think they need a little bit of luck. I think they need a little bit of faith, right? As John Harbaugh always says. Mm -hmm. And what they really need is this modern medicine to kick in <laughs> and, you know, cr crossing yeah. the fingers, right? <laughs> that the, that these guys have, speaking of honoring commitments, that that big list last Ooh. year of I guys that it. went down, right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. that list, the overwhelming majority of that list honors their rehabs, their their, mm -hmm. their respective rehabs, and mm. that they come back, that J.K. Dobbins comes back and isn't a shell of the star rookie that he was a couple of years mm. ago. That Gus Edwards continues to come back and just fight and fight and and just the, the yards that he picks up after contact are just incredible. That that comes back to a certain extent. Um, that on the defensive side of the ball, they get back to, yeah, the true no fly zone in Baltimore because yep. we see all the graphics that are out there, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I've been victim to putting those graphics together as well, right? I, I put it together and on paper, boy, does it look like mm -hmm. there is a true no fly zone. Um, but again, I think, you know, again, I, I don't want to think it's, nothing's too complicated about this thing. It's, it's getting guys back. It's, ensuring that their rehabs went well it's easing them back right we probably won't see a lot of those guys in training camp yeah. i think you're going to see and pat ricard kind of alluded to this not too long ago there's been a significant difference in mm -hmm. the training and conditioning program right. mm -hmm. and i know you've touched on that as well and deservingly so they needed to, to shift some things around let's be honest i don't know if if it was deserving of a of a true you know remake and remodel from from a, a department standpoint but i do know that john harbaugh said something at the end of last year and it looks like he stood by it and they were going to look at things top down make adjustments mm -hmm. as necessary whether they're they are necess necessary and will work in the long term 
We don't know. But what we do know, though, is that he held himself and, and his staff accountable throughout this offseason. Mm -hmm. They sure did. And, you know, something that's funny, I, it kind of broke my heart yesterday. Um, somebody, I forgot who it was, they posted this video. And it was of a raining of, of one of Ravens running back drills. And they showed Justice Hill. So he, he gave the ball to J.K. Dobbins. J.K. was cutting quick. I was like, OK, J.K. is back. Let's go. But then I uh, I looked at the comments and they were like, oh, this this video is from two years ago. And I was like, oh. I know exactly what you're okay. talking about because that thing was floating around recently. Yeah, because I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, uh, but it's, yeah. it's all good. Yeah. He'll be back eventually. But anyway, Bobby T, Bobby B, appreciate you coming through. Thank you. Um, just before we get out of here, give everybody a reminder one more time where they can find you at. Yeah, like I said, you know, just a few months into starting this channel, so you can find me on YouTube. Just type in my name, Bobby Trossett. Uh, that's, that's T as in Tom, R-O-S-S-E-T. And uh, wherever else you, you kind of screw with on social, right? Whether it's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you can find me in all those different spots. And and like I said, man, really appreciate you having me on. And I know I'll return sure. the favor as well soon. And as we all kind of get ready for for training camp and it's right oh, yeah. around the corner, man. You know how you know how summer mm -hmm. goes. Uh, the early mm -hmm. months are, yeah, they're slow, but you have your vacation <laughs> sprinkled in there, and you'll have a couple Thanks. moves made here and there. And I'm sure right. there'll be some some off the field stuff, right? Like we saw last last week. Uh, have we'll have some fun with it, but uh, I'm looking forward to all that. So thanks again, man. Oh yeah, for sure. Appreciate you.